I wear a lot of watches. I can test more watches if I'm constantly wearing one watch on each wrist. Sometimes I'll actually go completely crazy and wear four or five watches at a time so that I can compare heart rate data, altitude readings, power data, cadence, and GPS accuracy against multiple devices for a bike or a run or a hike. But recently, this little nagging question started to creep in. Could these watches, and more specifically, these watch bands, be hiding a little secret? Is there toxic chemicals that are leaching into my skin each and every time I strap one of these watch bands on my wrists? Toxic PFAS chemicals. But PFAS, from those known as forever chemicals. Toxic forever chemicals. They're colorless, tasteless, and scientists say potentially dangerous. Likely contain PFAS, also known as forever chemicals. Now, a blood serum test for PFAS can run anywhere from three to six hundred. Just the track, it goes directly into your bloodstream, highly Are concentrated. In every single human being's blood alive on the planet today. So recently, a class action lawsuit has been filed against Apple, alleging that some of their health-focused Apple watch bands contain dangerously high level of PFAS. For those of us that don't know all that much about PFAS, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoracyl substances, and these are synthetic chemicals that have actually been used in manufacturing since the 1930s. And some people call them forever chemicals because they don't actually break down very easily in the environment or in our bodies. They're actually resistant to heat, to cold, to oil, to water, all of which makes them super useful. And we actually think that there's over 12,000 different types of these PFAS chemicals. It's actually hard for us to tell just because they're constantly synthesizing these materials in science labs. And these PFAS chemicals are absolutely everywhere. So they're in your clothing, your cleaning supplies, your nonstick cookware, your mattresses, your food packaging. Uh, you can find it in any sort of water resistant material. It's in your personal care products. It's in your hygiene products. Somehow it's in your toilet paper. It actually seems to be part of every single industry. For example, in cycling, it's in your chain lube, your grease. It's in the paint that covers your bike or even the, the seat that you sit on and sweat on for hours. And yes, we think that it might be in our smartwatch bands. The three specific watch bands being called into question are the Apple Sports Band, the Ocean Band, and the Apple Watch Nike Sport Band, all of which use fluorastomer, all of which I own. Uh, this lawsuit seems to be leaning heavily on a recent study done by the University of Notre Dame, where they looked at 22 watch bands and they found that nine contain elevated levels of one type of PFAS. But what's interesting about this University of Notre Dame study is that the results were actually broken down by watch band price and the brands weren't specifically labeled. They were just grouped by price here. And we're kind of assuming that the Apple watch bands could be the ones that are in the more expensive category. So nine contained PFHA and 15 of the 22 bands contained high percentages of total fluorine concentration. And high fluorine levels are a key indicator of PFAS materials. What's wild about this study is that things don't line up the way that we would think that they would line up. With these three groups of watch bands, again, grouped by price, the inexpensive group, around five watch bands, all had less than 1% fluorine. The mid-price group, there were actually 14 bands in this group, two had negligible fluorine, seven fell into the 25 to 50% range, and five showed very high levels, 50% or more. And then finally, the expensive group, which we actually think probably includes Apple Watch bands, only one band fell in the medium range, while the others had very high fluorine levels. So it's actually a little bit frustrating to me that there's nothing in this study that specifically or clearly states which bands fall into which categories. But let's assume that our Apple Watch bands have a very high fluorine level for a second here. I think our next question might be, how freaked out should we be here? I mean, 
a little forever plastics in our bloodstream, it's, it's probably not all that bad, right? Well, sadly, the answer to that also isn't as straightforward as we might think. Uh, PFAS chemicals have been linked to multiple health conditions, including immune suppression, uh, hormonal dysregulation, developmental delays in children, low birth weights, uh, accelerated puberty, an increased risk of certain types of cancer, uh, in particular kidney cancer and testicular cancer, a uh, high blood pressure in pregnant women. Um, I, I like to think that Apple's next smartwatch might give us some insight into those high blood pressure readings, uh, but who knows? Uh, but the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer actually classifies PFAS as a possible human carcinogen. Specifically, uh, a meta-analysis actually found that high levels of PFAS exposure was associated with a relative risk of 1.74 for kidney cancer and 2.22 for testicular cancer. Uh, I'm starting to second guess my decision to melt down and inject the contents of my Apple Watch directly into my bloodstream. But I'm still on the fence here. Now, in a world full of 40 second videos, 140 character limitations, sensational headlines, I'm gonna do something a little crazy and try to dig a little bit deeper, not super deep, bear with me for a minute, because most of the harms that these PFAS studies are showing are within communities with very, very high exposures. We're talking about people that are living near plastic chemical plants 24 hours a day, seven days a week whereas the average person wears an Apple Watch band for about 11 hours a day. So I don't really think that we're talking about the same exposure levels here. But let's go absolutely crazy and explore a worst case scenario. Let's assume that we have a watch band that weighs about 30 grams. Imagine that over an entire year, your sweat completely dissolves the band. You've got some of that alien level, super acidic sweat somehow. And in addition to that, you've also got the type of skin that would make the brawny paper towel guy super jealous, and you're able to absorb 50% of the PFAS chemicals through your skin, and the other half just falls on the ground. So instead of 11 hours, let's also assume that you never take off your uh, cancer-tastic Apple Watch band. And so using the highest levels found in our study, around 16,662 nanograms per gram, that works out to roughly 250,000 nanograms of PFAS per year, or about 685 grams per day, which doesn't sound great, uh, or it doesn't sound great until you actually compare it to the daily threshold limits. Um, which were actually difficult to find. Uh, but in Australia and New Zealand, that limit is around 20 nanograms per kilogram, or roughly 1,500 nanograms for someone weighing 75 kilograms, or about 165 pounds. I guess if you're like me and you weigh about eight times that, uh, you can handle even more PFAS chemicals. Uh, but even in this extremely exaggerated scenario, we're under half the legal limit here. Now, to be fair, the EU suggested threshold is closer to 330 nanograms per day. And in that case, we're doubling the legal limit. But I still think that our worst case scenario is at least off by a factor of 10 here. But what about Apple? What has Apple said about this entire issue? Well, Apple basically said that their watch bands are safe to wear and that they've been tested by independent laboratories, they've done rigorous testing, and they've analyzed all of the materials that are used within the products here. And Apple's track record on toxicology of the materials used in their devices is pretty decent. Uh, in the 1990s, Apple started its safer materials program and they restricted some heavy metals and polyvinyl chloride. Uh, at the same time, they created their regulated substance specification, which required all of their suppliers to follow its own restrictions on hazardous substances. Uh, in 2009, they eliminated bromate, flame retardants, BFRs. Uh, Apple also eliminated two PFAS members from their products in 2010 and 2013, which was extremely proactive 
Keep in mind, at the same time, there was no global requirement to do so. Uh, in 2014, they eliminated benzene in hexane and chlorinated organic compounds in cleaners and degreasers from its final assembly process. In 2016, Apple added Tyoin and N-methyl-2 pyrolidone to its banned substance list. In 2019, Apple began requiring all suppliers provide information on all chemicals used in their manufacturing process as part of Apple's Chemical Safety Disclosures Initiative. And then in 2022, Apple published a report detailing all of this in their Toxicology Assessment and Materials Selection Report. Lastly, uh, also in 2022, and long before the University of Notre Dame study, uh, Apple released this report on its plans to phase out forever chemicals from its products. Notice it says plans to phase out and not eliminate. So I don't actually think that Apple is denying the presence of PFAS materials outright. I think that they're insisting that the current levels that they have are safe. And I think that they are clearly stating their plans to eventually eliminate you know, products that have things like fluorastomer in them. Not really for health reasons, but probably more for environmental reasons. And I think that it's important to at least reference the amount of time that it's gonna take for uh, any of these companies to make informed substitutions. Um, really, you know, any of the materials used in these products, the material engineers are gonna need to make sure that they're not gonna replace these plastics with something that's you know, worse for the environment or worse for our health. So what about the lawsuit? You know, realistically, I think that this lawsuit faces a couple of challenges. Uh, the Notre Dame study doesn't actually explicitly single out Apple anywhere within the study. The same study openly admits that more research is needed to understand actual skin absorption rates. Uh, and then there's not really any sort of definitive causal link between low level skin exposure and cancer here. What's really wild in this maybe has nothing to do with the lawsuit, but I can't imagine how much a successful lawsuit like this would open up countless companies. Uh, basically every consumer brand that makes products on the market could face similar lawsuits. Still, um, even if Apple wins in court, I think you know one of the major dangers here is that public perception damage has already taken place. Thanks to you know scary headlines and yes, of course, clickbait titles, just like the one that's in this video. Do they cause cancer? I don't think that we really know. I think that the science points to some concern at higher dosages, um, but there's not a lot of substantial evidence that your watch band is super dangerous. You know, personally, I actually prefer the nylon trail loop on my Apple Watch Ultra 2. Uh, but my 12 year old son actually prefers the Nike sports watch band. That's a watch band that was named explicitly in this lawsuit. So I don't know, do you guys think that, that I should switch it out for him? Um, would that be like the responsible parenting thing to do? Or is that just irrational fear? And maybe parenting is, you know, that's what parenting is, 95% irrational fear. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Comment section is right below the video here. Uh, and it's right below the like button and the subscribe button down there. Uh, finally, two quick announcements. Uh, I'm launching a new series called What Makes the Tech Tick, where we dive super deep into some of the fascinating technologies behind our favorite devices. Uh, there's an episode in here uh, that I'm really excited about. It's titled uh, The Wild Story of How GPS Becomes the Most Important Tech Invention in the Modern World. Uh, then lastly, uh, I wanted to mention that all of the sources that I used in putting this video together today are all linked below this video in the description, uh, but I'll also list them on the side here. So if you do wanna go and explore this topic further, you've got the links, you've got all the resources that I used. And as always, whether you're rocking a watch full of PFAS material or you're going nude with no watch at all, uh, I really do hope that you're getting out there and you're swimming, biking, or running. And I will see you guys on the next one.